wondrous, romantic. Gems have fascinated mankind for millennia, but a precious stone's beauty and rarity is only a part of its story. There is also adventure. Being a gemstone buyer, it's pretty amazing that I have that experience that uh, to travel around the world, to go to these places, to whether it's to the mine or to the source, to actually get that gemstone. This violet blue tanzanite stone, or this deep red ruby, aren't just beautiful and valuable treasures. They're also the symbolic end to an epic tale that began eons ago. 50 million years ago, it was deposited here, and all of a sudden, you know, you're the first one to see it. The thrill of discovery is only one chapter in a quest that can cross thousands of miles and involve hundreds of man hours. Set everywhere from primitive mines to modern laboratories, it is a tale that combines both traditional craftsmanship and cutting edge technology to create the world's most timeless works of art. From rough crystal to cherished heirloom, from deep underground to your dresser jewelry box, join us as we follow the gemstone journey. High in the mountains of southern Brazil lies the mining region of Minas Gerais. Minas Gerais is a great producer of gems, of precious stones, of gems in general, and the third in the world even until the present date. Today, the miners may ride an elevator instead of climbing rickety wooden ladders, but at this emerald mine in Nova era, the day begins as it has for centuries, with a trip deep underground. A thousand feet underground, the miners use power drills to punch holes in the granite face of the shaft. The miners attach fuses and detonators to the dynamite. Then, they move back a safe distance and set off the charges. When the dust settles, the heavy work begins, hauling the emerald bearing rock up to the surface. It's hard work to keep on bending down and straightening up. It's hard. This part, at night, is not fun. But freeing the stone from the rock isn't the first step towards placing an emerald on someone's finger. It is actually the middle of a journey that began millions of years before. What's commonly called an emerald is actually a green-tinted variety of the mineral beryl beryllium aluminum cyclosilicate, to be precise. All minerals are crystalline, and most of the gemstones are minerals. The crystalline structure is an orderly pattern that causes the same motif of atoms to repeat itself in the three dimensions regularly. It is a complicated process, requiring just the right amount of geological energy to properly align the atoms. It would take tremendous amounts of heat and pressure to actually create one of the pockets and one of the hard granite pegmatites. Over time, a tremendously long time, the emerald will continue to grow, adding new atoms onto its crystal lattice. For nature, uh, a thousand years is a very short time, so typically they take millions of years to grow. Despite being millions of years in the making, most of the resulting crystals will be too small to be seen with the naked eye. And even among those rare large crystals, few will be considered gem quality. Just because it's a ruby or an emerald or a sapphire or a diamond doesn't mean it's something precious or valuable. There are rubies, emeralds, and sapphires that aren't worth 50 cents a carat. The conditions to form um, gemstones that are transparent and they have beautiful color do not occur very often. Large, well-formed crystals are also very unusual, which makes this 330-carat rough emerald a rare find indeed, the result of just the right combination of chemicals and pressures. Emerald itself is a silicate that contains aluminum and a rare element called beryllium. The green color in emerald is caused by traces of vanadium and chromium. 
the slightest change in formula or pressure can produce dramatically different results. For instance, replacing the aluminum with manganese produces the exceedingly rare red barrel. It looks like an emerald. It's the same exact stru uh, crystal structure. It's the same exact uh, t type of inclusions, except it's found under the certain geological conditions that produce the color red instead of green. Depending on what trace impurities are present, barrel can also be pink, white, or yellow. Add traces of aluminum and iron, and the result is the delicate blue gemstone aquamarine. Aluminum and iron, or aluminum oxide, is what gives us the mineral corundum. And when titanium is added to the mix, we get another blue gemstone, blue sapphire. So a lot of people in the world sort of still don't realize that sapphires come in so many colors. They sort of think that um, sapphires are blue, rubies are red, emeralds are green. But as they're starting to realize a little bit now that uh, sapphires do come in every color. Sapphires can be blue, green, purple, pink, orange, yellow, and even red. Although if red, the stones are called rubies. Ruby and sapphire are exactly the same gem material with the exception of the trace elements that cause the color. So ruby gets its red color from chromium, and sapphire gets its blue color from trace amounts of iron and titanium. Depending on what uh, position it occupies in the crystalline structure of the mineral, the chromium that gives ruby a red color will cause an emerald to be green. So the crystalline structure of the material also has a very significant impact in the color that we see. Rare pink diamonds, for instance, owe their unusual color primarily to microscopic flaws within the gemstone's internal structure. It's not a chemical that's been caught up in the making of the diamonds. The molecules and things aren't lined up and that causes a refraction of light and then you get pink rather than white diamonds. White or colorless diamonds are unique in that they consist of a single element, carbon. But just like other gems, trace impurities can radically alter a diamond's tint. Chemistry and geology, however, aren't the only sciences that can start a gemstone's journey. Biology can also play a part. There are a big number of organic gemstones, such as ivory that comes from the tusks of elephants. Coral is also a very common gemstones produced by life. Jet, a fossilized wood, is actually a type of coal. Primeval forests are also the source for amber, which is a fossilized tree sap. True amber was found in certain regions of the world only, uh, the Baltic region, for example. It would wash up on the shores of the Baltic Sea as if it was a gift from the waters. But a round, lustrous pearl is by far the most precious organically produced gem. Pearls are formed when an irritant enters the oyster, or wherever the host happens to be. It starts coating it, starts secreting nacre. Now, nacre is made of two components. One is a natural blue called conculin. That binds everything together. And the second one is what they call calcium carbonate in the form of a mineral called aragonite. All these miniature little crystals are laid out layer by layer with that glue, natural glue, and it just keeps coating and coating and coating. And eventually, given enough time, that pearl starts growing and get to a pretty sizable uh, shape and form. Most gems, however, are a gift from the earth. Precious gems like sapphires and rubies and diamonds are found in all three types of rock, igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Almost every gemstone actually has some type of a matrix that it forms on. For example, emeralds are usually found in pegmatites. So then you'll see the emerald crystals forming right outside of that host rock. Igneous rocks, like granite and basalt, are formed when molten rock called magma rises from within the Earth's mantle. When magma crystallizes, it forms an igneous rock. If it crystallizes deep within the Earth and over a long period of time, uh, this magma will produce large crystals and it will form a plutonic igneous rock. If, 
On the other hand, the magma reaches the surface fast and it cools relatively fast. It can produce a volcanic igneous rocks. And gemstones occur in both volcanic and plutonic igneous rocks. Rubies, sapphires, topaz, and beryl are typically found in igneous rock formations. But the best known igneous gem matrix may be kimberlite. Historically, the most common rock type that yields diamonds in the world is kimberlite. Found in deep vertical formations called pipes, kimberlite is the hardened magma of ancient volcanoes. We don't have this type of volcano today. The youngest one we have is 35 million years old. Most of these were, were somewhere around 90 million years or, or even greater in, uh, in age. Sedimentary rock forms on or near the surface as sediments created by erosion pile atop one another. Over time, pressure compresses the sand, mud, and gravel, cementing it into rock. Gems found within sedimentary rocks include turquoise, agates, amethyst, and opals. Gemstones that form uh, in the sedimentary environment have to, to do a lot with water. Um, opal, for example, is formed by precipitation from silica out of groundwater that circulates through the rocks. Metamorphic rocks are rocks that have been changed by the heat and pressure of movements within the Earth's crust. As this happens, gems such as emeralds and garnets can grow within the rocks. Garnets are common in metamorphic processes that take place over vast areas where the pressure um, on a specific direction may be considerable. There are other type of metamorphic rocks that are formed through contact metamorphism. And usually there is a transfer of material from the igneous body that helps in growing new crystals, for example, emeralds. Emeralds, as a result, are relatively rare, with finds concentrated in only a few places on the globe. Garnets, formed by the immense pressures associated with mountain building, are one of the most widely distributed gems. Found worldwide and known by names such as Savorite, Pyrope, and Spessartite, they occur in a wide variety of colors, some more rare than others. Not just deep, dark red garnet, which most people think of first when you think of the January birthstone, but intense, rich green garnet, incredible fiery orange garnet, colorless garnet, brown garnet, yellow garnet. From deep purple amethyst to golden brown zircon, gemstones occur in dazzling diversity. Each individual stone a reflection of the unique conditions required to produce it. Gems are minerals, and minerals grow only when the conditions for their growth are adequate. If the conditions change, then the mineral changes. Slight variations in conditions also leave telltale fingerprints in the form of inclusions, tiny characteristics found within the stone. These inclusions often allow gemologists to identify a stone and trace its parent country or even mine. The best color in emeralds are produced by the mines in Colombia, the Shivor and the Muso mine. In the Shivor mine, pyrite may be also found as an inclusion, whereas calcite crystals in form of uh, rhombohedron may be found in the Muso mine. So it is possible to tell the origin of the emerald by looking at the inclusions. In some cases, however, there is little need for a jeweler's loop or microscope to determine a stone's origin. Certain gems, such as this brilliant blue tanzanite, are so rare that they have only been found in one place. The sequence of events that created tanzanite only occurred in one small strip uh, at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro in what they call the Marilani Hills, and that's only about six kilometers long and about two kilometers uh, wide. So far, they've found no other source of tanzanite in the entire world. Then there is hiddenite, an unusual emerald green variety of the mineral spodumene. It can occur in a pale green and it is found in, in many parts of the world in a very pale green. The deep green is rare and unique. Deep green hiddenite is so unique 
that it has even earned itself a spot on the map. It's just found in one place in the world, and that's it down in North Carolina. And by an odd coincidence of geology and chemistry, the deposit that produces this one-of-a-kind emerald colored gem also yields actual emeralds. You have this deep green hiddenite forming feet away from a rare chromium-rich emerald crystal, two totally different gem materials in virtually the same color. Um, but they crystallize differently, their chemical composition is different, and their, their uh, optical qualities are different. Just fascinating. Gemstones aren't always found where they were formed, however. As rocks are weathered by wind and water, gemstones are often eroded out of their original matrix. Those fragments are easily taken by the rivers or uh, by the ocean and transported as sediment. Eventually, as the water slows, the heavy gems will settle to the bottom, accumulating in deposits of alluvial sand and gravel in riverbeds. Typically tumbled and polished by the journey downstream, the rough gems found in alluvial deposits are often of high quality and easily recovered. In fact, alluvial mining is the oldest method of mining gemstones. It's a method that stretches as far back as recorded history. Among the most rare objects on Earth, gemstones are an elusive treasure. To find them, prospectors such as these emerald hunters in Hiddenite, North Carolina, often search for what are called indicator minerals. More common and less valuable than gemstones, indicators are typically found in association with the desired gem. We look for associated minerals such as your pyrites, your tourmalines, your rutils, um, and albites, which is a uh, feldspar type crystal. We look for all the combination of minerals here, and then we know that we're in an area that there's potential for emeralds. Then it's a matter of digging or drilling to determine whether the desired gem occurs in a marketable quantity. Opal miners in the Australian town of Cooperpedi spend days drilling core samples, looking for precious opal's telltale opalescent glint. Like exploring for oil or steel or copper, gold, we drilling. We drilling, and if we cut some traces or a bit of uh, reasonable thickness opal, we open up. Alluvial finds can also lead an experienced prospector upstream to the gemstone's primary deposit. For instance, small amounts of alluvial diamonds had been mined in Australia since the late 19th century. But it wasn't until the 1970s that a company called CRA located the ancient volcanic source of the gemstones. Purely by good luck and good fortune, uh, CRA discovered liberated diamonds in stream sediments on Smoke Creek. And at that point in time, they only knew that the diamonds were actually coming from upstream. And they then actually followed that stream up into what we know as the Argyle Pipe today. The amount of luck involved in some gem discoveries is downright legendary. For example, while it has been less than four decades since tanzanite was first found in 1967, its origins are already shrouded in mystery and folklore. It's a new gemstone, very new in comparison to the sapphires and rubies that have been around for thousands of years. Tanzanite may be a new gemstone, but in rough form, it has been around for millions of years a seemingly worthless rock littering the foothills of Mount Kilimanjaro. When you see it in its original form, it's kind of ugly. Have you ever seen rough, kind of Coke bottle color? It's kind of be brownish, greenish. It's just a weird color to see. Natural blue tanzanite is extremely rare. Intense heat, however, will turn that previously ugly stone a deep translucent violet blue. But it took thousands of years and, supposedly, a chance thunderstorm before a Maasai shepherd stumbled across the secret. The story going around Tanzania was when the lightning strikes evidently provided the heat needed to alter the color. And what they're saying is as the storm came through, somebody came afterwards and they saw the material change and, oh my gosh, it's a beautiful violet blue color. Mining Tanzanite was initially a simple matter of picking up the stones scattered across the hillsides but the search soon went underground. First, when they got there, you could literally pick the crystals off the ground. It was amazing. Now they're going down to over 300, 400 meters. 
Mining methods vary according to the type and richness of the deposit. The wealth of the country where the deposit occurs can also be a factor. In poor third world countries, many alluvial deposits are worked as they have been for centuries, with a shovel and a sifter at the water's edge. Have you ever seen people panning for gold? It's kind of the same thing. They pan for gemstone. In wealthy Western nations, the mining of rich alluvial deposits can be highly mechanized. Australia's Crystal Mining Company uses modern heavy machinery to dig up the alluvial sapphires entombed in the dried up ancient riverbeds of the continent's Gemfield region. We've drilled it first, so we know roughly where the deposit of sapphire is. We have to then strip the overburden off, and then we excavate and cart the wash out of the pits which, of course, is transported up to um, behind us here, where the wash plant is. Modern hard rock mining to recover gemstones from the original matrix is typically done on a similarly massive scale. In this open pit mine high in the mountains of Brazil's Minas Gerais region, workmen use bulldozers to break up rock containing imperial topaz. Then, a crane and dragline bucket hauls the topaz-bearing matrix to the top of the mine for sorting. At present, it's the only mine in the world where we can get the topaz gem. The others are insignificant. 95 to 98 percent of the topaz in the world comes from this mine. Diamond pipes are mined on an even more massive scale. Australia's Argyle mine, currently the world's largest producer of diamonds, employs a small army of highly trained technicians to operate hundreds of millions of dollars worth of state-of-the-art machinery. We like to mine with the best equipment, using the best knowledge and experience that is out there in the world. Therefore, it does make our operation a lot more efficient and a lot safer because we're using the latest equipment and the, um, the latest techniques. At the other end of the spectrum are the Tanzanite mines in the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro. They're using pick shovels. They have wooden ladders that are made from scrap wood. And these are nailed together. And these kind of guys will sometimes climb down a few hundred feet into a totally dark hole on this wooden ladder. And I looked at it and I said, wow. Technology-wise, there's really only one thing separating the Maasai tribesmen's techniques and those employed in the ancient and legendary mines of King Solomon, dynamite. At night, what's really amazing, when you go back to the hotel, you'll start hearing a rumbling in the background. And you hear, whoom, 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 whoom. And it sounds like massive thunder. It's actually all the miners sending off their charges under the earth. They do it after the mines are cleared out. They place the charges, everybody gets out, and they start having these explosions one after the other. And it sounds like the roar of thunder throughout the entire field, and it'll go on for sometimes for hours. Whether the digging is done with bare hands or heavy machinery, one thing remains constant. They move a lot of earth just to find a few little pieces of crystal here and there. For example, um, in uh, on average, it is necessary to uh, process a big volume of kimberlite, maybe uh, hundreds of tons of kimberlite to get one carat of diamond. And uh, from that volume of diamonds, only one fourth will be gem quality. For Australian opal miners in Coober PD, processing is a simple matter, using methods miners have employed for millennia. You just pick it, put it in the bags, and then go home, wash it, the buyer comes, and the money on the table, and that's how it is. Once unearthed, the stones are one step closer to the consumer, but the journey is far from over. The gems are still in rough form, and they have to be sorted and separated. In the Imperial Topaz mines of Brazil, bulldozers may do the digging, but the processing is still done by hand. The crushed and washed ore is dumped onto a conveyor belt where workmen pick out the topaz. For us to be able to get one carat of gem here at the mine, we need to remove two cubic meters of soil from the mine down there. Meanwhile, at Australia's Crystal Mining Company, the sapphire rough is sorted and processed by purely mechanical means. The uh, front-end loader comes, 
Tips the material into the hopper. From there it goes through and up the conveyor belt into the trommel. Inside the trommel is big high pressure jets of water which actually hit the material and bust up the lumps of clay and clean all the material up. When it comes out of there it goes through what we call a pulsator which is worked on water pressure with diaphragms in the ends of it and as it pulses the material flows across the top and of course the sapphires and ironstone being heavier they sink to the bottom. The ironstone is removed with a magnetic separator leaving the sapphires some as small as one millimeter across. So they 100 pieces to the carrot which are um, mainly used in um, watches in Switzerland. To remove rough diamonds from the crushed ore, Australia's Argyle mine uses an even more sophisticated machine called a photomultiplier. There are x-ray machines which spray from all sides the rocks with x-rays. When a diamond sees the x-ray, it fluoresces a bright blue, and all of a sudden, this thing will just shine like crazy. When the photomultiplier tubes uh see the visible light, they initiate the air blast, which blasts the diamond material into the concentrate stream, and the, uh, the gang material just falls by gravity into a waste stream. Whether the work is done with x-rays or magnets, the machines can accomplish in a matter of minutes what once took days to do by hand. Years ago, uh, it was all done by hand, and we'd have drums and drums, like tons and tons of material, all had to be picked by hand, and it took weeks, months to do it. Now, um, with the processing we do today, we come home, the next day it's all run through, gone, um, ready for market. Then, once the last minuscule gem is recovered, the stones are ready to be graded, cut and polished for the wholesale market. A gemstone's market value is based on what are commonly called the four C's, carat weight, clarity, color, and cut. Each of those has impact on the beauty of the stone, the desirability of the stone, the rarity of the stone, and thus the price of the stone. Carat weight, the first of the four criteria, measures the mass of the stone. One carat is exactly 200 milligrams. Carat does not mean size. It doesn't mean how big is it. It means how heavy is it. Diamond weight and size cannot be equated with color gemstones. The overall size of a one carat stone can vary greatly depending on the relative density of different gems. The actual weight of diamond, for example, is lighter than ruby and sapphire and heavier than an emerald. So if you had three stones that all weighed one carat, a one carat ruby, a one carat emerald, and a one carat diamond, and they were all cut in the exact same shape and at the same proportions, the ruby or sapphire would look almost 25% smaller than the diamond, and the emerald will look larger than the diamond. The second C, clarity, is a measure of a gem's internal characteristics called inclusions. They can be microscopic crystals of some other gem. They can be little gas bubbles. They can be stress fractures. They can be lots of really interesting things. You can get an imperfect diamond that might have a, a sapphire embedded in it, which I've seen, and it, it's gorgeous. Diamonds are graded on a 12-point sliding scale ranging from flawless to included. But for colored gems, it is almost unheard of to find a stone that could be considered flawless. People understand diamonds, and they don't expect to see anything with their eye in a diamond. That they come to expect that same characteristic in colored gemstones, and it just doesn't exist in the world of colored gemstones. Color itself results from the presence of trace elements. So from the very start, you're going to have more inclusions. As a result, colored stones are held to different clarity standards than diamonds. With diamonds, there's a very precise grading system. With colored gemstones, there is no universally accepted grading system, and each 
category of gemstone is different in terms of what is acceptable. In general, when judging clarity, colored gems fall into three broad categories. In category one, those gems form under the gentlest of geologic conditions. You don't expect to see something with your naked eye. Then there's category two. They form under more difficult geologic conditions. It is not at all uncommon to see minor things with the naked eye. The third category of colored gemstones form under the most violent geologic conditions. Therefore, they are more prone to have cracks and other features readily visible to the naked eye. Emerald is the classic example of this. And in fact, when one sees a large, deep green emerald, and they don't see anything with the naked eye, the first thing people wonder is, gee, I wonder if it's real, because we are so accustomed to, to the fact that emeralds do have inclusions that are usually visible. Typically, the more inclusions in a stone, the lower the price. But these tiny imperfections are also what give each individual gem its own distinct personality. The great jeweler on Fifth Avenue in New York City, Harry Winston, he would describe the emerald inclusions as a garden, and he would use the French word, Le jardin, the garden. It just sounded so romantic. So he turned this feature around into a plus. The third C, color, may seem self-explanatory, but it actually encompasses a wide range of characteristics. The color of a gemstone is given by three parameters. The hue, essential, the impression of body color that we get, the tone, how light or how dark, dark that color may be, and the saturation, how vivid or pure the color may be. A gemstone will be more valuable the purer the color. But pure color, like perfect clarity, is a standard that nature rarely achieves. There's no such thing as a pure spectral green or a pure spectral red in nature or blue. The color is always modified by some other color. For example, when we think of um, rubies, we can think of purplish red rubies, or some are more slightly orangey red, more fire orangey red. When we think of blue sapphires, some of the blues have a faint green component to the blue. Some have a slight purple component to the blue. Some are really close to a pure, pure blue, but None is absolutely pure blue. No stone is a pure green. So you're always having to judge the modifier. How much is the color altered by the presence of another color? A stone's color isn't always consistent either. Nature doesn't just go and blow color evenly throughout a stone. So. You have to also evaluate something called zoning or distribution of color. Some gems are more prone to having colorless zones. Sapphire is one, amethyst is one, citrine is one. Some gems can also combine more than one distinct color in a single crystal. Called multicoloring, the phenomenon is common in many different varieties of tourmaline with some examples showing as many as 15 different colors. Australia's Gemfield region also produces an unusual multicolored sapphire. The unique part about this sapphire deposit here at um, Central Queensland is we get all the colors. We do get pink and purple, we don't get a lot, but we get you know all the lovely greens and yellows and what we call party color, which is a um, sapphire which is sort of half blue and half yellow. Whether it's a rich red ruby or stunning blue tanzanite, what color is right for the consumer is largely a matter of personal taste. But before you buy, be sure to look at the stone under different types of light, because the light environment can greatly affect a colored gemstone's appearance. Fluorescent lighting, the light itself is very heavy on the blue-violet end, and there's no red-orange component in the light. That's going to affect blue stones, and it's going to affect red stones. Red stones, it frequently affects adversely. So you have to ask yourself, 
Are you wearing this all the time? Are you wearing it only in the evening? Are you wearing it mostly in the day? What type of lighting are you likely to be wearing it in? And look at the color of that stone in that type of light and make sure you like it. The fourth C, cut, represents the next major stage in a gemstone's journey from formation to finished product. And since the vast majority of gems are cut in a handful of centers around the world, cutting often accounts for most of the actual mileage in a stone's trip. A lot of the semi-precious gemstones are cut in uh, China and in India. There are a lot of the sapphire and ruby are cut in Thailand. Most diamonds, depending on their size and quality, are cut in one of just a handful of places around the globe. India will take care of a lot of the small diamonds, the melee diamonds that are labor intensive. Israel takes care of a lot of the fancy cut diamonds. Belgium takes care of little larger diamonds and New York usually takes care of the bigger diamonds. China has really been up and coming in terms of a diamond cutting facility. Wherever the work is done, the way a gem is cut is generally dictated by the geometry of the stone. Oftentimes, gemstones will be cut according to the crystal structure. In other words, we want to maintain as much weight on that piece of stone, on that gemstone, uh, that is going to be uh, maintaining the most value to it. So, for example, emeralds are usually cut in emerald cut. In particular, the Colombian emerald, because that grows in a long crystal. So they will cut it in a square or a rectangular uh, format to maintain the most weight on there. Sapphires and rubies, because of the way the rough occurs, are usually cut in what we call a cushion cut, which is sort of a square with rounded corners. The geometry of the rough, however, isn't the only thing a skilled cutter takes into account. How a stone is cut can often enhance a gem's other defining characteristics, particularly color. People who are skilled cutters cut to maximize the color and the beauty of the color. So if the basic rough crystal is a little bit light, you might cut the stone a little deeper, a little more weight in the bottom to intensify that color so it faces up with a richer color. Ruby, it may show a more vivid uh, red in one direction and a paler pink on the other direction. So it is in the skill of the cutter to uh, orient it so that it will show the best color. A skillful cut can even trick the eye when it comes to size. I've seen rubies and sapphires, for example, where you can have a two carat stone here and a one carat stone here, and you can ask the consumer which is the largest and all of them will say the one carat because the one carat was cut shallower, the two carat was cut deeper. It really relies on a person's experience and some of them have a lifetime of experience of cutting just that one gemstone, whether it's a ruby or a garnet. They cut that stone year after year and you find that they have just such a knack for looking at a piece of rough and determining what shape is going to be the best and, and produce the best color, the, the best clarity, and the most beautiful stone that will come out of that. The cut, however, isn't the only way to improve a gemstone's beauty and value. Over the centuries, man has developed a wide variety of both traditional and high-tech methods to improve a stone's clarity and color. One of the oldest methods of gem enhancement dates all the way back to the age of the pharaohs. Using a technique still used today, the ancient Egyptians discovered that rubbing emeralds with oil improved both their beauty and durability. Emerald has been routinely um, oiled uh, for centuries. They're prone to little fractures. When light goes through and hits those fractures and gets scattered, it can cause whitish areas throughout the stone, by putting a colorless oil into those cracks, it provides a medium through which the light now travels through. So it eliminates that whitishness. Another centuries-old technique, detailed in ancient Indian manuscripts, 
applies searing heat to sapphires and rubies. In Sri Lanka, it's been an ancient tradition to actually take some of the sapphire and ruby rough and put it in coconut husks and throw it in the fire. The flames not only improve the stone's color, heat can also make the stone look brighter. Raising it to uh, 1,700 degrees or higher, you will actually find that it oftentimes will not only improve the color of that gemstone by driving off the secondary color, the off color, but it'll also improve the clarity as well. Some of that silk or haziness actually kind of melts or disappears there. Virtually all ruby and sapphire sold in most jewelry stores for decades now has been subjected to this routine heating process to improve the color. Other gems typically subjected to heat treatments include zircon, aquamarine, and tanzanite. More modern methods employ lasers or even radiation to enhance clarity and color. Bombarding the gemstone with particles is the main way in which uh, the gemstone is altered. All gemstones entering into the United States market are regulated by the government. And if a gemstone is irradiated, then it's required to go through this cool down period where it then is no longer a danger to us. High-tech treatment techniques and modern mining methods have greatly increased the supply of gems, which in many cases has also reduced their price. The result has transformed gems from a rare luxury only the rich could afford into something millions of middle-class consumers can enjoy. There's a large demand, especially a global demand, when you look at the burgeoning uh, middle classes in China and India, for example. There are a lot of people that want gemstones. To meet that rising demand, prospectors and buyers scour the globe searching for new sources of gems. The quest touches every continent. No place is too far or too remote. When we went to Vietnam, they said, okay, do you want to go to the mines? And we said, yes. Well, it was a car ride till the road ended. Then when the road ended, it was, we got on motorcycles, you know, it was back as motorcycles, and then we drove over little bridges, streams, through hills and rocks and everything else to, we couldn't drive a motorcycle anymore. Then we hit the mountain and it was, you know, a climb to the top that was hours long. You know, so that, I, I wasn't in shape for that by any means, but would I do it again? Absolutely. You know, because you're going to the source. But the never-ending search for gems is, in many ways, a race against time. There are a lot of gemstones in Brazil, in Madagascar, in China and other places around the world that produce some great quality stones, but it's not a bottomless pit. It, that mine has a pocket there and it produces that, that certain amount of material. When that's gone, it's gone. Demand for certain gems so far outpaced supply that if we had to rely on what the mines were producing in whatever quality it was alone, no one today would be wearing blue sapphires or rubies. Luckily, science and technology has increased the supply of colored gems. Many of the gems sold today don't begin their journey deep underground. Instead, they start out in a laboratory. Gem crystals grown in a lab are known as synthetics. Available in an array of colors and used in a variety of applications, synthetics typically cost much less than stones found in nature. They are not, however, fakes. A synthetic diamond or color gem is physically and chemically identical to the one created by nature. The chemicals used are identical. The stone is essentially the same thing except in a synthetic it's created in a laboratory, it can be mass produced, you can control the factors, versus the one that's made by nature. Most synthetic gems are produced by one of two techniques, both of which were developed in the late 1800s. The flux method was developed by French chemist Edmund Framey in 1877, though it was not commercially available until the mid-1900s. When gemstones are grown through the flux process, um, what is done is to use another material 
to lower the point at which the nutrients that are going to go into the formation of the synthetic gem are molten. And that material is called the flux. Commonly used to create synthetic emeralds and diamonds, the chemical ingredients are melted at very high pressures in a platinum crucible. When the molten material cools, crystals will form. Repeated over and over, the process can yield large stones. The flux techniques produce the more expensive uh, type of synthetics because they more resemble the way in which nature works. The resulting diamonds and emeralds look identical to natural stones, but there are differences in the way they are grown. And those differences leave telltale signs. For example, microscopic traces of the flux will appear as inclusions in the stone. Within a synthetic emerald formed by the uh, flux process, this will live like platinum plat platelets within the emeralds. The second method for making synthetic stones, flame fusion, also leaves telltale signs that a trained gemologist can easily spot. Developed by the French chemist Auguste Vernoy, the process is primarily used to produce synthetic sapphire and ruby. As it drops a powdered oxide, the chemical components, through a very, very hot flame onto a spinning rod. When it goes through the flame, it melts. It hits the rod, it recrystallizes. Actually, as it cools down on the rod, it hardens into ruby or sapphire, for example. These bulls, as they are known, grow quickly and can be quite large. They are truly very inexpensive and they are used for costume uh, jewelry mostly. Under a microscope or a 10 power loop, their synthetic origin is readily apparent. You can see curved patterns. Uh, curved stria are common in ruby. They look like the grooves in a record or curved color banding can be seen in flame fusion uh, blue sapphire. In addition to rubies and sapphires, synthetic spinel can also be made using the flame fusion process. Spinel comes in every color, well, just about every color, and it became one of the most frequently used stones to simulate, to imitate other gemstones. The latest synthetic gems can easily deceive the untrained eye, but scientists have also developed the means to spot them. While modern technology can recreate a gemstone's beauty and brilliance, no lab can capture the mystery or the romance of the real thing. It's the whole package that surrounds that. It's the, that sense of adventure really makes the value of that gemstone so much more. In other words, the secret to a rare stone's ageless appeal isn't just the gem, it is also the journey.